Hello and welcome to Go With The Heat. I'm Dominic. And I'm John. I'm Melissa. And this is your cultural guide to the phenomenon that was Miami Vice. This week we're talking about Season 5, Episode 16, titled Victims of Circumstance. It originally premiered on May 5th, 1989. Both the name, timing of this episode, and everything involved with it has a really interesting connection with modern news that's happening right as we speak. Yeah, and- it's a little eerie, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the writer is Richard Lorre, and this is the only episode he ever wrote, but the director is Colin Buxy. Now, Colin Buxy, you might recognize that name. He directed Rock in a Hard Place. Like a Hurricane, and Death and the Lady. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Before we get started, can check into each other's lives. Pals, here's what we have to do. We have to clear the deck. Everyone get off the dance floor. Everyone back up, back <laughs> off. This is Saturday Night Fever. Melissa's come in in her polyester white suit, and she's got some problems with people. She's got to vent some. She's got to air the grievances. ABC is directly in her crosshairs. Because we've talked a bunch on this show about how there's reboots and the reboots are dumb. How come no one can think of new TV shows? Melissa, dance floor is cleared. Everyone is watching. <laughs> I discovered by doing some research last night, they are doing a remake. And not, a, not a remake, I guess it's a sequel almost to NYPD Blue. And I am not happy. <laughs> Let me just I make, am not happy. <laughs> for everyone who doesn't know, which is very few people know this, Melissa worships. NYPD Blue. I do. She is, we were in between doing other things. She's like, oh, I'll just plow through NYPD Blue one more time. Like all 11 seasons in mm-hmm. like three weeks. Yep. I went tore through it, <laughs> which makes me even more angry because I, okay, I'm giving spoilers, people. And if you want to watch that show, I don't care. So you're getting them. Do you think they'll bring back Zach from Saved by the Bell? No. Okay. So I read about it. I read the, I read the synopsis of the show and I'm very angry. I'm very, very, very angry. <laughs> I love NYPD Blue. I love Sipowitz. Come at me. I don't care. I love him. (laughs) I love me some Andy Sipowitz. Dennis Franz, I love you. Okay. (laughs) Thank you for not going back on this show. So the show is going to, it's going to set around Sipowitz's son, Theo, who in the show, you know, when the show ended, Sipowitz was, now I'm going to spoil everything for everybody here, but go for it. The show's old, but (laughs) when it ended, the show, the show ended, Sipowitz became the lieutenant. He was like the man in charge. Finally, he had grown, he had kids. He was married. He was happy. He became lieutenant, and that's how the show ended. Well, the show is going to center around his son, Theo, who's now an adult, and he's becoming a detective, and he becomes a detective by solving his father's murder, and I am not okay with that. How did you let him get through all those seasons of being shot in the butt, being shot again, having prostate cancer? He also had a heart attack. I mean, (laughs) but he gets killed as an old man. (laughs) I'm not happy. Ah. I was hoping Zach from Saved by the Bell would be, but I don't really care if they kill Sipowitz. I guess he's too busy. <laughs> the guy from really? Saved by the Bell, he was too busy. To, he's too busy, yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I think I'm I'm thinking obviously they must ask Sipowitz to come. I don't even call him by his real name. Dennis friends to come back and he must be like, is he uh, no, I'm done. State fairs? What the hell's he doing? <laughs> I don't understand the need to reboot things and like have this legacy of the previous show because they couldn't get Dennis Franz apparently to be in the show. So therefore we killed him. That way fans will stop asking, where's Dennis Franz? How come Dennis Franz isn't making an appearance? So like, ah, he's dead. This is his son. He's going to avenge his murder. And then we'll pretend like it never happened. Also, that guy looks nothing like his son. (laughs) I saw the actor. And you know what? You better not be trying to bring back Jimmy Smith's ghost either. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the people who watch the show, they actually did that. They brought a they, Jimmy Smith died. He's already in been it. a ghost once. He's, and he died in it, and then they brought him back as a ghost. <laughs> that was the best looking and ghost I've pottery. ever seen, but he was a ghost. <laughs> <laughs> well, speaking of ghosts, we have many ghosts haunting a specific man in this week's episode of Miami Vice. And uh, it gets a little weird. And that's not the weird part that I want to talk about. I want to talk about the weirdness of that camera shot with the overlay of the car door on it. Can't (laughs) wait to talk about it. I'm upset about that. (laughs) Very angry about that. Let's talk about that later. Let's first get on with this episode. So we open up, and speaking of that old man, it's like House of Mirrors. He's there's people banging on the door, they're yelling at him. He's telling them to go away. He goes and gets a knife, shaky cam style. It, it, it's like a music video. Like, I expected Ozzy Osbourne to start singing at any minute. Oh, that's true. I didn't think about that. Like, a nine inch nails music video. It is like a dream. Three doors down before the Republican. <laughs> 
it's like a dream sequence. He runs to the phone, calls, yelling, where are you? As we'll find out later, we all know who he's calling. And then we just hard jump to somewhere else where three Six. random guys are having breakfast. And one of them is very familiar, guys. It's Orlando Calderon. That means Tubbs Finally. Jr. must be around here somewhere, right? Finally, we're going to, this is the episode, we are going to get answers on where baby Tubbs is. Orlando Calderon is back in Miami. He goes by Angelo now A for different some last reason. name also. <laughs> Strange, but. <laughs> we're finally going to get those answers on baby Tubbs, right? 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 No, sadly no. we're not. Uh -huh. Oh, well, I mean, anyways, they're having a great breakfast. They're talking about fishing. The restaurant owner wants them to leave, but, you know, they're having such a good time. Angelo's the only one that's got something going on, so he leaves. And when he goes outside, the duo are out there staked out watching the restaurant. I, I love the beginning of the that scene because the it starts with Sonny just bitching up a storm about how boring surveil surveillance is. Angelo goes to leave. And so they flip around and start following them in the car and somehow miss the shootout that occurs in the diner immediately after they leave. Exactly. Also, how do you undercover in a convertible? <laughs> <laughs> Parked right across the street. <laughs> right across the street. <laughs> They've been really Don't have a lot of time to plan, Melissa, when you get up at noon 30. <laughs> They've been really bored on the stakeout. They, then their conversation, they're talking about uh, how the people, the, the Alvarez brothers sleep in late. They've just been really bored. So when Angelo goes to leave, they're actually kind of excited. There's something to do other than just sitting there watching them have breakfast. And they just get to the stoplight. And that's when they hear the shooting and they go back. And a man inside opens fire, kills everyone inside. The Alvarez brothers, the restaurant owner, the staff. Everyone that is inside of that restaurant, the duo come running in. Shooter is gone. All the gangsters are dead. They have no idea what happened other than just this huge pile of bodies that's inside of there. Tubbs comes back in after checking out back. And now they're gone. He's kind of casual about it. And he, then he finally sees all of the dead bodies that are laying on the floor of the restaurant. And Sonny is beside himself. He can't handle seeing the carnage that lays there in the restaurant. Well, I mean, that has got to be so embarrassing. We just got over the episode where they watched those two cops going to door to door get murdered. Mm -hmm. And now here they are on a stakeout. A shooting occurs. And not only do they not catch the perp, they don't get a look at the perp. They don't even get a shot off. Now they have to sit there with all the dead bodies and wait for the detectives to come and ask them all those questions. So you didn't see anybody. <laughs> no cars. You can't give us any leads. Detectives. Nope. <laughs> Before we move on, this is our chance to check in with this week's guest stars. John, there's more than one that looks familiar in this week's episode. Yeah, guys, it was good old reunion. Miami Vice style. We've got a couple of repeat offenders. Obviously, John Leguizamo, who plays Angelo Alvarez, who we know from season one and season two as playing Orlando Calderon in the episode Sons and Lovers in the Afternoon Plane. You know, the episode where Tubbs goes to Fantasy Island. <laughs> that one. <laughs> so we've already talked about, we did a deep dive in him after the first season. He's a comedian, actor, producer, director, to Wong Fu, thanks for everything. Ice Age, the John Wick movies, something that you might not know, and I'm sure I probably touched on the first time. One of his earliest gigs was an appearance in Madonna's first top 10 hit, Borderline. Ah, I remember that video. I didn't know he was in that. <laughs> Our next repeat offender is Paul Guy Foyle. He plays John Baker. He also played Milton Glantz in the episode Death and a Lady. You would know him probably as playing Captain Jim Brass on CSI for 14 years. His first movie, the classic Howard the Duck, uh, and he followed that up with Beverly Hills Cop 2. He had a pretty good start to his career. He's actually been in a bunch of stuff. He got like that cherry gig on a TV show and just wrote it for ha for a decade and a half. Our third guest star to find his way into another Miami Vice episode is Xander Berkeley. He plays Metro Date Officer Bailey, but he also played Tommy Lowe in the episode Like a Hurricane. Oh, yeah. Okay. He gets blown up with the explosive cassette tape. Oh, yeah, he puts it in. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he's got nearly 200 acting credits. He's been in some big movies, Fabulous Baker Boys, T2 Judgment Day, Apollo 13. He guest starred in a, in a 
at least in one episode of CSI with Guy Foyle. Since we already talked about him, we'll move on to our next guest star. And our next guest stars, they all kind of have a theme here. So we have Stefan Girish, who plays Leo Krebs. He began his career in 1951 on the, appearing in the TV series Goodyear. Goodyear Playhouse. He followed that with roles in Mr. Peepers. <laughs> the Defenders, then Gunsmoke, Nanza, The Untouchables, we have it in here. Lots of cowboy stuff. And then Kung Fu and Startsky and Hutch to round out the 60s. The 60s were weird. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Cowboys and Kung Fu. His first movie was the 57, The Young Don't Cry. And then you can imagine it continues on with more westerns. Our next guest star is William Hickey. He plays Hans Kozak. He debuted in 57 in an episode of the series Decoy. He also showed up on the Defenders TV series One Life to Live, The Equalizer, Moonlighting, and Crime Story. So there's your Michael Mann connection. And then Wings of all things. <laughs> <laughs> Movies. His first movie was A Hateful Rain. A couple of the other big ones, Pink Cadillacs and National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation. I was just going to say, I know him as whatever the uncle name is in that where he's got the toupee and, uh -huh. <laughs> and the big cigar. <laughs> yep. He blows up their tree. Yep. <laughs> and then our last guest star is Karen Black, who plays Helen Jackson. She starred in movies debuting in 1959, the movie being Primetime. Other notable roles, she was an Easy Rider. She had, she got an Academy Award nominee for Five Easy Pieces. By the way, another Western. Wow. <laughs> and she was also in The Great Gatsby, the original. Yeah. She is a so, big deal. Yeah, like, she was, actually, yeah. to get her on this show, yes. looking at her credits, she's in like five thousand movies i couldn't believe it when we looked at her stuff yeah. like how many movies she'd been in or things she'd been in yeah and i'm not gonna go through listing them all i'm just gonna say this i've made a lot at the lack of guest stars in this season but to be honest with you even though they may not be household names now stefan garash william hickey and karen black are all very accomplished uh, actors and actresses karen black being the biggest by far they all have a ton of movie credits they were in a ton of stuff they were big names back in the 50s and 60s so vice actually went out and got some really really big name stars as far as old, old hollywood's concerned they didn't actually cheap out on us this time <laughs> When we come back from the opening credits, we're back at the restaurant and the police are investigating there with homicide. You know, in case you forgot that a homicide department exists. I don't <laughs> think. Is. I didn't know there was one. <laughs> and he is pissed. He's like, who's going to clean this up? <laughs> like, like, like he's, he, he's mad because they made a mess of the. And then he starts going off about how he misses the old days when assassins took pride in their work and only killed one person. Even Sonny says, yeah, no professional pride, no aim, just splatter. Yeah, Sonny's really upset in this one. Is he eating? He's holding a spoon. <laughs> no, he's not eating. He's like looking at the spoon. Sonny sees on the arm of the owner who uh, the homicide detective goes into great detail, talk about how great of a man he is. Mm -hmm. Like just, he was just a nice guy all around. Yeah, he would feed the people and the, the homeless people in the back. And that's how he got one of his waiters mm -hmm. was the guy who was digging around. He's actually the garbage writing can. a book about him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It was, he was like digging around in the garbage can and he brought him in and made, made him be a waiter. He forced him to work for the food. No, <laughs> Sonny sees the tattoo on his arm, serious in numbers, but he doesn't say anything. He notices it, but doesn't trigger anything in him. What it could be. Well, Tubbs isn't that bright, you know. He maybe not. If he tried to talk to Tubbs about it, he might not know. <laughs> <laughs> I love that they're sitting at the end of this scene. They're sitting in the booth next to Angelo's dead brothers, and they're like, you know "What? I bet Angelo had something to do with this." <laughs> So they do a take off and they go grab Angelo. They're trying to muscle him. It's like, we know, why did you leave right before the shooting happened? We know there's something involved with you. And Angelo's like, what are you talking about? It's like, your brothers, they're all dead. And then he's like, what? oh my God, what do you mean my brothers are dead? What were they going to do to him in that pool? Why'd they take him to that pool? Were they going to kill him? <laughs> I was really concerned for him. Like, why are you taking him to an empty pool? Are you either going to skateboard in it or kill him? So what's the deal here? <laughs> to be fair, he he did kill Tubbs' fiance and steal his child. I mean, true. Yeah, Tubbs does have his... <laughs> Tubbs like, you look so familiar. Oh, you look so familiar. I can't put my finger on it. <laughs> Something about a car explosion, maybe? I, I, I can't. Angelo eventually comes around and says that they were dealing with the Diablos and that the Diablos might have a bead on when a deal is going to happen with the Fuentes. 
you know, Elix says it without saying it. Yeah. No way the Vice team's able to put it together. Tubbs is able to fill in the gaps. Diablos might want to intercept on this deal. Sonny comes over to Angelo and says, hey, you did the right thing. It's all right, pal. Also, we're not going to... We're done talking to you, so... We're going to leave you in this pool. <laughs> <laughs> Hope you can get yeah. out. <laughs> you know, there's a ladder right over Swim there. Swim it off, it. brother. Swim it off. <laughs> <laughs> so now the duo are going to go to where this deal is supposed to happen between the Fuentes and their dealer, and then also the Diablos are going to infiltrate this deal. I have many questions, so let me first describe this scene, <laughs> and then let's break this down, because I have many, many questions of what happened here. Yeah, I don't understand it either. A boat pulls up. It's transferring new tires that are full of coke over to the Fuentes. The duo see this. Sunny even says, oh, they just got hit by a blizzard. When the deal ends, the duo can see the Diablos running over to the Fuentes, and then they wait until the Diablos get there. And then say, okay, police move in. They get there after the Diablos kill the Fuentes. And then they try and drive away in the van. And that's when the Sonny opens fire on the van, kills the driver. They get the passenger out alive. And they're able to, you know, go interrogate him. Now let's discuss. Oh, a, okay. them waiting for the Diablos to murder the Fuentes yeah, did, before stopping them. Also, why did it take yes. them so long between when they called for bat? They're like, okay, you guys can move in. To when they actually moved in. It was like a really long time. When, when they called for it, they had, the guys had just got to the Fuentes. And then they and then they waited for them to be murdered to actually <laughs> call to action. I want to go back even further. Yes, the Diablos are terrible at skulking. And <laughs> it is the most obvious. They are like making the most obvious approach. Like everyone in the neighborhood can see them coming. Before we even get to that, let's get to the Fuentes who are buying the tires full of Coke. Like sticking the knife in and, and licking the knife and stuff. <laughs> like, yeah, it tastes like that. All right, party. <laughs> the gooberest dealers in the world. The dudes at the boat, man, they're smart. They just boogie on off. They got their cash. No one even goes after them. They just let them get murdered right there and drive off with the van. As they're driving off with the van, I thought, like, oh, good. Here, we're going to have a good old vice car chase. Instead, Crockett just whips out his gun and just starts firing into the into the <laughs> van and just takes them out, you know? Yeah. And then, like, like they, they get the passenger out, but it's like... We're lucky. You're lucky he's alive. If they had backup, how come they couldn't like set down tire strips or something I like that no to idea. take the van out? Like, why do they have to kill one of them? But that's not that's not the point I want to get to because this next scene at the police station, they're interrogating the survivor. He says he wasn't anywhere near the diner. He was at church all day. Sonny starts to rough him up a little bit, Anything. and then this very shocked police officer <laughs> comes eyes. in. His yes. Eyes. The officer had seen some shit when he opened that door. <laughs> like, there was something bad happening when he came into that interrogation There's room. There's someone here to see him. <laughs> that it's smile the- afterward, too. Oh, Crockett, you again. <laughs> what it turns out being is that the priest and the mother of the bride are there to corroborate his story, saying that he was there at the church. There was nowhere near the shooting at the diner. He's an idiot. We hate him, but he was at the church. <laughs> Mm-hmm. So the duo go back to their desk. So the back to... Yes, yeah. So here's the point th- that I'm getting to. The duo go back to their desk. Sonny is di- disappointed. And Tubbs says, at least we took down the Diablos and the Fuentes. Well, the Fuentes are dead. <laughs> was this the plan the whole well, time? Well, I mean, I guess to them, they don't care. Was this, you know what? We didn't get the shooter at the diner, but we let two gangs kill each other. <laughs> <laughs> They're taking care of everybody. Yes. The Alvarez, the Fuentes, everybody. <laughs> It's kind of a win, depending on how you look at it. Exactly. He says there's too many slime balls out there. Sonny, it's, sorry, Sonny says it doesn't matter. There's too many slime balls out there. There's always more where that came from. But Tubbs is like upbeat. We got the winter stick, care of, so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> hey, he's a glass. <laughs> Good <very> job. Full. <laughs> Not empty. Kind of guy. That's when Gina walks over and says that there's been another hit. Same as before. So the dude will take off to go take a look at that. Still, just to make sure nice. I'm totally clear, they let the Diablos kill the Fuentes and then tried to bust the Diablos and they killed one of them. They were able to get the other, get him for 25 to life for killing the Fuentes. And they're like, all right, cool. Great job to get you guys. <laughs> See, and I'm glad you brought that up because that's going to help make my point in closing arguments. But I'll, I'll save that for later. <laughs> I, I did want to point out I had a speaking role and East. She has a job still. She gets to take messages for Crockett. Not completely out of the Vice Squad yet. <laughs> so, 
<laughs> no Trudy. We even get a no. really, really quick look at what I think is Trudy later. <laughs> From the side. <laughs> we have a really fast scene, another scene with the old man. We'll find out later is Kozak. Old man stabby. <laughs> He's having another dream sequence, yelling at the people banging on the door. So now the deal are going over to this apartment. Where there's a homicide, a couple killed. Now same Kravitz. Tattoos <laughs> on the arm, clearly a survivor of an internment camp. And now see, other Jewish see, people. It took like me a says, second to realize about the tattoos. I thought originally that it was they had the same watches. I thought so watch these. Uh, <laughs> Damn, those watch these are serious in Miami. <laughs> and this is when Sonny catches on. He sees it. Yes, Tubbs. And Tubbs like, yeah, I recognize that too. Those are from concentration camps. And that's when I start to put it like, like, oh, this is. We went the wrong direction in this. Mm-hmm. Yeah, this isn't uh, gang related. This yeah. Is, this isn't. Um, this is like race related. Not Yeah, <laughs> this is race related, not gang related. However, before we move on from the scene, this is the first time we see the very crudely filmed of a car <laughs> driving by that's clearly someone with a camera walking and a superimposed image of the inside of a car door how did this ever make it to air it was the 80s how did quantum <laughs> leap make it to air <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but it did okay i mean things happened in the 80s not everyone's proud of it <laughs> it just happened the quality of the show normally is spectacular but this hey to give him credit scott Bakula is still on tv butchering a new orleans accent <laughs> yeah <So>. i know <laughs> I, I just keep hoping that he finally wins like a daytime emmy and they finally and he can finally jump <laughs> he can finally leap <laughs> That filming, Colin Buxy, I'm looking at you, man. <laughs> it's all you. <laughs> How can this make it to air, bro? You could have just had to be a camera across the street as they see. You didn't have to superimpose the car. I'm going to move on because I'm going to get too worked up and we still have one more of those <laughs> scenes to go. And I already got too worked up about NYPD Blue. <laughs> <laughs> so they do go meet with Dr. Krebs at his office. He's His foundation tracks down Nazi war criminals and then deports them so they can be tried by their country for what they've done. He had heard about Cy, the restaurant owner, and now he's heard about the Kravitzes. And he says, I know what's going on here. They all witnessed the crimes of Hans Kozak, a death camp official during World War II. I know that because I was also a witness to those war crimes. And this is clearly Kozak, who lives somewhere in Miami, trying to kill all of the witnesses that way, like, he can't be deported or stand trial or whatever have you. He's trying to kill everyone. Yeah, which is a little premature considering that they don't know where he is. Like, I don't know how they can get a tribunal together to deport him when they don't know where he's hiding. I don't know what Kozak, how he's been able to hide. But then we've seen in the news, like, people are hiding in plain sight all over the place, even up until, like, recently. Yeah, but, been, it, I mean, mm-hmm. let's be honest, it's not that many people that are working on these things. It's very few detectives, I don't know what they call them from other countries, that are still working on these things. It's not like they give a lot of manpower to this anymore. Something does come out of this scene. I think it shows the difference in the times from then till now. It immediately jumped to the one and only politician's name who has associations with the Ku Klux Klan and Nazis, which obviously, if it were today... The list would be much longer. (laughs) So Krebs is also being threatened by some group called some people with no balls called the Patriotic Brigade. And they're headed by someone named John Baker, uh, who I hear like those people all have no balls. So (laughs) we're just saying. (laughs) Krebs says that he's not going to be scared off, that there's still two witnesses, himself and then one other person. So now at it might be a temple it's not it's just like a community center mm-hmm, i think that's mm-hmm. what it's supposed to be i wasn't 100 sure where it was it's krebs giving a speech about this exact topic we're not gonna be scared off there's still these people that need to stand for justice outside fake car fucker i'm gonna find that fake car i'm gonna find that person walking down the road with a just with the door frame <laughs> walking down the road <laughs> Like not a cardboard cut out of a door frame. <laughs> it's Manny. I found him. <laughs> and this is when the Patriotic Brigade comes storming in, chanting, White is right. A reluctant Sonny and Stan stand up and tell Krebs to let them speak because now they're going to try and infiltrate these uh, lame asses. And this is, this is when it goes off rails. Reluctantly, 
They start up and they start a brawl in the middle of this thing. Uh, they're supposed to, mind you, I, I believe they want to take care of the safety of the guy speaking. I'm not too sure after this scene because it just starts out in an <laughs> o- over an outright brawl just so that Sonny can join this hate group or is he trying to go undercover? I, I can't figure that out. <laughs> Does he really want to join the group or is well, they, stage, they do some crazy stuff? They stage Tubbs then standing up and telling them to shut up and then they start to fight and then the Donnybrook breaks out and they stage it perfectly so that Tubbs is going to go attack Baker but then Sonny will save them, then they'll be buddies. However, before we get there, my favorite moment of this scene is where Stan hits two police officers and Tubbs with a chair. <laughs> that was the bet. <laughs> like they were taking, and then and then Tubbs jumped on Stan's back. <laughs> Stan got his revenge. Yes, he did. <laughs> yes. This is for you guys always ignoring me and never letting me ride in the car with you. <laughs> <laughs> so now so down- they all end up in lockup together. Stan and Crockett are doing their best. Hey, we're racist too. But I love how Sonny introduced like, I'm Burnett. And this is Stan. Like Stan doesn't even get a last name. <laughs> Yeah, they're talking about some really racist stuff. And also, they took our gerbs. Um, <laughs> no, people can't live here anymore, et cetera. Whatever. They're a bunch of dumbasses. Sunny says, thanks for paying our bail. And then says, hey, I want some action. I know a place. Like, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Like, hey, mm-hmm. we should hang out. As they walk out of the jailhouse, a reporter named Helen Jackson stops Baker and says, I want to interview for my piece about the radical right. Baker says, sorry, Miss Jackson. No, I can't. I lost it. <laughs> I am for real. For real. <laughs> I went on like Never the whole the, exactly. <laughs> Never meant to make your daughter cry. <laughs> Helen stops Sonny and Stan and says, Listen, I'm not unsympathetic to you guys' cause. I want to do an interview for my article. Can you set me up with Baker? And Sonny's like, You got it. Sure. You, you got it. That's touch. how Ann Coulter got started. <laughs> You heard it here, folks. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Back at the precinct, Tubbs comes walking in. Stan and Sonny are working. Tubbs says, hey, Slugger, you know my sister hits harder than you. Because <laughs> there was that <laughs> moment where, you know, Sonny punches Tubbs. Tubbs is like, yeah, you're you're weak. Oh, we knew that already. <laughs> no one talks about Stan. <laughs> yeah. And actually, Stan's like, hitting people with chairs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and another piece that we don't Stan know about. Stan ain't around. <laughs> Another piece we don't know about Tubbs, like, he has a sister? Does he really have a sister? (laughs) So after a few jokes, they start talking about Helen. They want to get a wire on her place. That way they can hear this interview that she's going to do with Baker. And then they're off to go to this fake deli in this building that's set to be torn down. This is where they're going to show off for Baker and the brigade. They pull up. I missed the part about it being a fake deli a <laughs> building that was going to be torn. I was like, oh my God, are they, they just start unloading on it and then throwing Molotov cocktails through the windows and burning this down. Like, what's <laughs> happening? They're like, Crockett and Stan, where's dad? He needs to reel him in. There is a lot of trust in this scene because they're shooting up this abandoned building. The stage that they look like, they are one of the dumbasses that's for this brigade. When the people with shit for brains. <laughs> then Stan pulls out these two pipe bombs and Sonny lights them and then Stan throws them. That's a lot of trust. He just holds them while he lights them. <laughs> they yeah. go wrong, Stan. You're going to lose your magic fingers. <laughs> 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 You'll never do magic again. Baker likes what he sees. So then they go back to his place. Eh? Uh huh. <laughs> Baker explains they got a wartime strategy. Always attacking. Ready to fight the enemy. Take it to the streets. Then he takes Sunny. Here's this computer. thing I did on my computer. I call it the internet. <laughs> this is what I call the cloud. <laughs> <laughs> they have a list of all the enemies for the militantarians. It's so they can find them and attack. Sunny says, why not just release it to, to the public? And ba- Baker says, we can't do that. Liberal media. Is this is this like a Trumper episode or I don't something? No, like, I think uh, it might be. Yeah. <laughs> like, is this what the whole movement is based on? This this like their whole dumb e- ecosystem is all based. Never mind. <laughs> it's all based on this. <laughs> and, and Sonny does exactly what you would think a Trumper would do. He suggests to use Ann Coulter. I mean, Miss Jackson. <laughs> Which I think is very irresponsible of, a, of an undercover cop to say, "Let's use this civilian reporter in our undercover investigation." But okay. That's exactly what I was saying, because at this point, we don't know anything about her. She could be doing some expose and she's trying to infiltrate them, too, yeah. and then wants to expose them. They have nothing, but they just volunteer her without her knowledge 
that she's going to interview Baker and be right in the middle of all this. Also, how'd they get a warrant to bug her house? How do you even get that? Like, she, if she didn't do anything wrong, so why would yeah, she get a warrant do for anything. her? And not only that, but you can't bug. If they think that she's a journalist, no, see, you can't. You can't do that to a journalist. I don't. For, for the record, I don't think it's her house that they bugged. I think it's his house. It's or a, his, or it's, his that, that's all or something. something. Yeah, that that's all fake news. They didn't bug anything. <laughs> yeah, it's fake. <laughs> Stupid media. <laughs> so we're gonna go to the Carlisle now, where Helen is interviewing Baker, and Baker goes on and talking about how his lazy ass dad lost his job at the mill, and uh, he the is, best you know, interviews are at CD most motels. Yeah. <laughs> and then he goes into crazy town about the Jewish conspiracy. I bet he's one of those like flat earthers. He like <laughs> believes like dinosaurs are from the moon and the earth is flat and like all that he's stuff. He's like that too. guy that took off from that rocket he made here yeah. where we live. <laughs> <laughs> it's just his conspiracy is so bananas, so just badass crazy. He starts by saying like how immigrants somehow closed the mill his dad worked at and they were hired by the Jews to punish white people for some conspiracy or it makes zero sense. It makes less sense than a sci-fi movie plot. <laughs> <laughs> the vice team is down in the basement. They're listening to everything, but they're not able to get any evidence. Baker doesn't say anything specific about crimes that they're committing. He just gives her an interview about, about being in crazy town. It, it's, it's literally like watching Ted Cruz try and cheat on his wife with a Fox news reporter. <laughs> Gross. I mean, maybe they'll finally catch the Zodiac Killer. I mean, <laughs> uh, maybe that's what this episode was about. <laughs> the Vice team is pretty sick about what they're hearing, too. Like, it's really hard for them to listen to this crazy stuff. And, but, and also knowing they can't do anything about it, which is going to come up again. This is where we get the quick scene of Tubbs in the van with what, I, what appears to be Trudy, I think, maybe. <laughs> Drill quick. At the precinct, it's... The team have found that there's nothing going to happen tonight as far as the kill that they're expecting on the other person, not on Krebs, but the other person. They're not sure what's going to happen, but they don't think that they're going to move on killing the other person tonight. There's something else going on. Jacob Hoffman. That's there the we go. Hoffman. Name. Hoffman. That, that's the name that I was looking for. There's not going to be a move on Hoffman. They don't know what's going on tonight, so they're going to go stake it out. Stan and Sonny obviously going in. And then Tubbs is going to be outside. So Baker essentially takes Stan and Sonny to a clan meeting. And that, that's what this that's like is. A, a rally, just a clan rally. Uh, yeah. See, I thought the medieval times had gone down. <laughs> it had taken a dark turn. The brigade is having a pep rally about their wartime fighting strategy. Sonny's getting frustrated because they're not going to be able to get any info from Baker. Baker's just like, hey, check out how cool we are. And Sonny radios to Tubbs in the van and says, it's just a rally. There's nothing that we can do tonight. It's just a dead end. Oh, I'm sorry. That's... That's where we see what looks like Trudy in the van. Meanwhile, at the Baker's, someone breaks into the Baker's house, uses the computer to look up Jacob Hoffman, and steals a floppy disk titled Disc C. Classic A. Yeah, she tech stole too. his floppy. I mean, someone <laughs> stole his floppy. <laughs> someone. We don't know who. We get another quick scene of the old man yelling at the door. Then we go <laughs> to the retirement home. Hoffman is talking to his son. And his son is begging him, please take the protection, please leave, let's, let's escape, let's leave Miami. And Hoffman is saying, I'm never going to forget Kozak or his face. Even all these years later, I'm staying, We're gonna. I'm going to help Krebs bring down Kozak. I'm not leaving until that's done. And then this is when we get the twist. Because then the nurse comes over to take Hoffman back and Hoffman says, see, I got a good hair anyway. They take really good care of me. And you see, it's Helen. It's Helen Jackson. That's Actually, the nurse she kind of looks like Daryl Hannah in Kill Bill. <laughs> At the baker, Sonny comes in and B Baker says, we've been robbed. <laughs> Sonny says, who? And Baker says, it's the Jewish conspiracy. Krebs is making us look bad. And, and Sonny's like, what the hell are you talking about? Yeah, because Krebs broke in there with his cane. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, as we see later, Krebs might be able to do that because he's a fucking badass. That's true. So uh, not only did he survive a death camp, he's, he's, yeah. he's got brass fucking balls. <laughs> so he, a, there might be a legit shot that he did break into this house. <laughs> Sonny calls into the precinct, and Gina says Hoffman's been killed. And Sonny says, they're supposed to be under protection. What the hell happened? She's like, I don't, I don't know. know. <laughs> <laughs> they so, don't know. No one knows. They're doing an investigation. Everyone was on break at that exact moment. 
So now we're going to go back to that old man who we've seen periodically throughout the episode. We're going to find out this way and find out that it's Kozak and that Helen is his daughter. She has been taking care of him and she's also been the one that's been killing everyone to protect her father. And he's nervous that there's still all these witnesses and also those voices that we've been hearing are voices in his head. He is haunted by the people that he's murdered. Mm-hmm. And he feels like if he kills all the witnesses, that maybe it'll lift his conscience. Like, no one else will know it but me, because all the other witnesses will be dead. And it doesn't work that way, pal. Nope. You're going to be haunted forever, because well, you're uh, a fucking dirtbag, yeah. first of all. Yeah. Well, I think his grand, uh, or his daughter, I'm sorry, not granddaughter, his daughter, she's pretty convinced that killing them is going to work, too. Yeah, I wonder if she hears the voices. No. She doesn't hear the voices. <laughs> she's not crazy. She's just... <laughs> Stupid. <laughs> she says, you want to be tormented anymore? Kozak says, what about Krebs? He's the last one that maybe if you, basically, if you kill Krebs, these voices will finally stop. And Helen takes a deep breath, says, okay, I don't think he's going to testify. It'd be your word versus his word, but I'll go with, get this taken care of. See, I think he's not as crazy as let's on. I mean, I understand, like, they show him and he hears voices and stuff like that. I think he's manipulative and he's manipulating her. Like, I think he knows, like, he just wants those people to be. You're right, because he thinks if he does that, he'll have a clear conscience and they won't come get him. But the way he acts, he, he could have left Krebs alone. And she's right. They would put in his word against his. and Who knows what would happen? But you're right, because he oh, says okay. that Krebs is a liar. He'll yeah. get people to lie for him. Yeah, and all he's, this very, stuff. he's very lucid, he, he, very clear. Yeah. For somebody who's supposed to be crazy, it's right? Gotta be, and it's got to be tough being in that little room all day. He's missing shuffleboard as we speak. <laughs> <laughs> Quick scene at the Royal Palm. The homicide investigators there with Sonny. They're wheeling out Hoffman's bodies or the, the couple because he killed both of them. No, no. He killed the nurse. Oh, okay. So, remember okay. He, so what he did was she. She killed the nurse first. Ten hours before she killed mm, Hoffman and okay. got her outfit and then took off and killed him. Yeah, so she was just hanging out at the hospital for like eight and a half hours. Mm-hmm. Sonny talks to Tubbs. He found a witness to the uh, saw the nurse that took Hoffman. And he describes her. I mean, it's a very really vague description, but she's got piercing blue eyes. He was basically saying she was a looker. He was like, man, she was hot. <laughs> yeah. And Sonny says, ah, Jackson, got her. Because <laughs> Gotta be her. Sonny saw her piercing blue eyes also. And not her breasts. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <laughs> so now we're going to go to the center where Krebs is in the final scene of this episode. Helen comes in and is talking to Krebs. She says, I have some questions. I'm a reporter. My father was at the same camp that you were at. And he says, okay, like, let's talk about this. This is his foundation. This you you might does. know my dad. He killed everyone there. <laughs> they sit down and Krebs says, you have to know what kind of man Kozak is. He has to come to justice. He's a sick, sick man, and you should know the crimes that he's committed. And Helen tries to say, we should hear the other side. He's not all bad. Helen gets up, but that's when Baker comes running in, accusing Krebs of stealing his disc. And Krebs is looking at both Jackson and Baker like, what the hell are both of you guys talking about? Yeah, what is going on? I don't know what's going on. Great. He's mad because she stole one of the discs for their little MySpace, their little (laughs) racist MySpace they're making, you know, white space. (laughs) What's great that no one talks about is that he is sitting by himself waiting for the award show to start. Like, this is the saddest thing I've seen. I don't know what he was waiting for. Just chilling. I think he was, yeah, he was just, you know, a uh, speech. He was going to get into war. He was oh, going just going to hang speech. out. You just start six hours from now. <laughs> He's an old man. They show up really early to things. <laughs> I mean, most old people do anyway. I don't know. <laughs> so well, then- he seems to be enjoying the company because he doesn't move <laughs> from the chair at all. He just continues talking <laughs> to these two crazy people, one with a gun, the other one yelling about floppies, floppy disks. <laughs> Baker sees Helen and says, you, you're working both sides. You set me up. And she says, I don't give a shit about you or Krebs or what anyone's agenda is. I have my own agenda. Pulls out a gun, shoots Baker, and then shoots Dwayne, his in partner, penis. right in the dick. <laughs> that was the best part. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's a really small aim there. You couldn't have a very big one. <laughs> Also, why did Baker not be? Why was he not scared when she pulled out the gun? She pulled out the gun. And he's still like, "You use me. I don't like being used." <laughs> you dumbass. She shoots him. <laughs> he got what he deserved. The Fuentes didn't do anything wrong. They're drug dealers. Whatever. Yeah, whatever. Yeah. Baker deserved to be shot right in the dick, and that's what he got. <laughs> Krebs watches the whole thing and realizes Helen is the one killing all the witnesses. 
Helen says, I'm ending the persecution of Kozak. She says, he was ridding the world of criminals. Greb says, what the hell are you talking about? I saw a murder a woman and her children in front of her before he's a monster. She doesn't want to hear it. Yeah, that sounds like dad. And Krebs says, in an effort to help your father, you have become him now. That's when the duo come racing in. Helen gets distracted like a fucking boss. <laughs> Krebs smacks Helen's gun out of her hand with his cane. Doesn't even stand up. He just smacks the gun out of her hand and continues to sit there like yes, nothing happened. He doesn't even like yes. make any kind of facial expression. He just doesn't like no, get this out of here. Get this out of here. The man is a fucking badass. Uh, yeah. Survived the death camp. <laughs> yep. <laughs> goes around the world looking for the people who ran those death camps and to personally prosecute them. And then in the face of danger of one of the ones that ha- the one that he's been looking for the most, his daughter's there with a gun. He just casually slaps the gun <laughs> out of her hand. <laughs> I'm telling you, this is the most excitement he's had in a while now. <laughs> All of these visitors hanging out, wanting to talk to him, all this. <laughs> I don't know how he walks. Which, by the way. balls so gigantically <laughs> big. That's why he needs the cane. <laughs> yes. It's too big. That's why he needs the cane. <laughs> I do admit, Miss Jackson, after all of that elaborate planning, was thwarted by an old man with a cane while sitting down. <laughs> like, went through all of that to kill all of those witnesses to be thwarted by... An old guy with a cane. (laughs) (laughs) So they do all arrest Helen as she screams. They handcuff her. They walk her out. There's a big crowd outside. So you'd be thinking like, hey. She she dedicates the crime spree to her dad. I thought it was weird. (laughs) (laughs) So he stops, asks her why. She says, for my father, he's a great man. Suddenly, Angelo appears, says, this is for my brothers, shoots and kills Helen. He runs away. Surprise, Sonny shoots, bitches. <laughs> Sonny shoots Angelo in the leg and he goes down. No, Sonny can't shoot people in the leg. That's crazy. He can do that. He can just wound them. <laughs> guys, he always had to shoot to kill. He must like Angelo. Guys, so, so yeah. And so Angelo pops up, reminds us that he was even in the episode. The ending gets even worse, uh, even weirder. because Not just because Angelo pops up out of nowhere, but because after he shoots and kills there's their suspect in handcuffs and they shoot him in the leg. Tubbs and Crockett proceed to casually just walk off down the street into black. <laughs> End of the episode. They just walk off. First, Tubbs comes walking back after capturing Angelo and says, Hey, is Helen dead? Nah, she's taking a nap. Like, what? <laughs> yeah, she's clearly dead. <laughs> She clearly did. She's not moving. Her eyes are open and she's got like 20 bullets in her. <laughs> she's faking it. <laughs> and then, yeah. And then they, they just, just walk off down the street. They just like, walk aren't off. they like needed for happened. the investigation? <laughs> aren't they needed for the investigation? Don't they need to like, yes. some paperwork or give statements or something? Like the, it's just the, point Their down. suspect was just shot and murdered. They just shot armed suspect. Like, there should be a ton of paperwork. They, how could they just walk off down the road? And the whole crowd goes with them, too. Everyone's like, okay, guess this is done. <laughs> they grab yeah, one this is over. They point over their shoulder. Like, he goes, okay, I've got to go deal with the dead body. And everyone <laughs> just walks on. It's like the ending of Breaking but, but 2. Like, electric got shot in. Angelo's not dead yet, guys. <laughs> He's writhing in pain. You can't leave yet. <laughs> Don't you want to know where Tubbs Jr. is? <laughs> <laughs> and that's the end of the episode. Uh, we took a weird turn when we got here to the end. I didn't ex- fully expect Angelo to come back. Um, the, obviously, the walking off is weird. That's yeah, a weird that way to was end weird, it. But- that's okay if this was like a one-time action movie. And like the studio's never going <laughs> to yes. make a sequel. <laughs> true, <laughs> true. So we can just end it with them walking off into the sun. Like, that's fine. You can't do this on a show that's going to have another show next week. You mean like Brian Bosworth and then? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, technically, there, mm-hmm. as just aired on NBC, next episode would be the last episode. Which is crazy. That would make no sense when you watch. I don't get it. <laughs> yes. It's, it's going to make so, no sense to so you guys. You mean, you yeah, it makes even less sense in order because then that would mean that their suspect got shot. They shot an armed suspect and they just grandly walk off the street only to just decide to. Uh, to just wrap things up as a series, which I assume means at least one of them won't be a cop anymore. Like, like it's just weird. Because I'm actually going to kind of defend that walking away bit at the end. 
Not necessarily because that's the right thing to do, but because of what I think the story was trying to say. So, but before we get there, we got to check in with this week's music. I don't want to give away as I normally do all my final thoughts before we even get to the final thoughts section. (laughs) (laughs) Let's go break down this week's music first. All right, John, up to now, we've had some pretty lackluster music selection in the episodes, but this episode feels different somehow. What do you got for us this week? I've got some new stuff for you. It's not particularly interesting, but it's new. (laughs) (laughs) So let's start with the first band. We have Misguided Angel by Cowboy Junkies. Cowboy Junkies is kind of a eclectic, like, they're, they're kind of music for music snobs, I kind of think is the best way to put it. So it's weird. They're an alternative country and folk band from Toronto, Canada. They formed in 1985. None of this this beginning stuff is going to make you think considered one of the most influential artists. But just follow with me. A country (laughs) folk band from Canada in 1985 (laughs) formed by bassist Alan Anton, Michael Timmons on guitar, Peter Timmons on drums, Margot Timmons on vocals. By the way, guys, all of the Timmons, they're related. (laughs) I'm so used to that being like, everyone has to see my name. No relation. Actually, even their brother John was in the band, but he left before they released the first album. Shout out to unofficial member Jeff Bird, who literally recorded on every album but the first album, but is it listed as as a band member? Sorry, Jeff. <laughs> Alan Anton, Michael Timmons, they formed their first band in high school called Hunger Project. Hunger Project, and actually you, you may or may not have heard of them because um, they actually did have a fame about them. And they would move to New York. They would play the club circuit. And in 1981, they got their first multi-city tour. So after that tour, Hunger Project moved to the UK. They toured there for three months, released a single, and then the band kind of fell apart and they disbanded but anton and timmons stayed friends and this becomes a theme with them like they took a year off and just hung out in germany they started a duo improv band called germinal and like one of them worked at a record store for a year they basically just effed off in london and learned about music and finally germinal broke up in 84 and they returned to toronto in 85 and formed Cowboy Junkies with Ben's siblings. So Germinal would break up, is break up even though it was just Alan and Mike. Alan and Mike would move back to Toronto in 85 and they'd form Cowboy Junkies with the rest of Michael's family, apparently. This guy who really wanted to be a music producer in Canada heard their sound and helped them record their first album in 1986, which they recorded in the family garage, made a makeshift booth in their kitchen, and they recorded with a single ambisonic microphone the album being titled white off earth now that's an interesting that album, title like what the heck does that mean <laughs> yeah yeah so and that first album would sell two thousand copies which isn't much but it's enough to get you a little bit of a tour going and would get them enough to get full album made their next album would would actually go double platinum in canada single platinum in the u.s and then their four following albums would go platinum gold 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 all in canada they went from selling three thousand copies of some off-brand album that they made in their garage very next album going platinum in u.s in the u.s and canada damn so to add some perspective so that first album going through the history of this them as a band it's constantly like we were trying to find the sound of middle eastern combined with blues combined with it's this really artsy always trying all these different experimental they were a uh, alternative folk band whatever the heck that means you know <laughs> they were very critically acclaimed because of their the different styles of music that they played and everything. And they were totally that band that would be like, they literally dropped uh, everything and moved to China for three months and record an album inspired by their living in China in a small village in China. Like They're that musician. They are actually hugely influential as far as like deep cut music nerds, music snobs, as far as the, the, the kind of stuff they did, they dropped like 12 albums. In fact, they're still dropping albums. They dropped an album called All That Reckoning in 2018. Outside of all that, not a whole lot of interesting stuff. No, <laughs> th- no therapy pillow fights. No 
uh, stealing <laughs> David Bowie's guitars. <laughs> um, no one's going to rehab. Like they have a pretty awesome life. You know, they've, they've traveled the world and they've made great music and they're very accomplished and they're from Canada. So I assume that they're very nice and polite people. <laughs> Good for cowboy junkies. Our next song is Severance by Dead Can Dance. Dead Can Dance. There's got to be someone Australian on the Vice crew. Because Dead Can Dance is an Australian music project formed in 1981 in Melbourne, Australia. Now, guys, we've had a lot of Australian bands, a lot of bands very popular in Australia. I don't know why that is. Dead Can Dance, they were formed in Australia. They relocated to London in 82. That was a mistake, re relocating to London. It's just in Australia, don't you know? Uh -huh. If you're Australian native, you can be huge. They'll just buy your stuff, no matter what it sounds oh, yeah. like. They're missing out on all that Australian money. All those didgeridoos. <laughs> I am I am 75% sure that their currency is called a didgeridoo, <laughs> by the way. Dead Kid Dance was formed by Lisa Gerard and Brendan Perry. They were a couple at the time. And it also featured Erickson on bass, at least originally. Their music described as African polyrhythms mixed with Gaelic folk mixed with art rock and about eight other things that don't make any sense. No, pick a genre and stick to it, damn it. Yeah. So another description, early, early work, was described as goth as it gets. Drum-driven ambient guitar uh, and chanting and howling. So <laughs> chanting and howling and all different kinds of crap. <laughs> but for whatever reason, it was super popular, particularly in Australia. They made a ton of didgeridoos. They made so <laughs> many didgeridoos that they followed it up with a four-track album called Garden of the Arcane Delights. And they were just, things were still rolling. But their second album, Spleen and Ideal, they added session musicians on cello, trombone, timpani of all the <laughs> instruments. Cello, trombone, and timpani, which I, apparently they were trying to go for a medieval Europe, Euro sound. Well, it, it kind of worked. In, it, they released it in 85. It hit number two on indie charts. It got them serious cult following. In Europe, Dead Can Dance at this point in the in the mid '80s, they did not have any distribution in the U.S., so they were relatively unknown. They started to get that cult following by the '90s. Actually, gotten distribution through Warner Brothers. Their Into the Labyrinth uh, album sold half a million and helped build them a solid following here in the U.S. '89, Gerard and Perry had broken up, even though they were still working and writing together and recording together. That wasn't going to last forever. And by '98, they officially broke up, broke up, as in stopped making music together. They would stay broken up until 2005. They would do a reunion tour. They would do the whole box albums and box, you know, the box sets and. Greatest Hits albums uh, eventually would spark another tour, which would lead to another reunion tour, which as recent as 2018, they announced that they are about to release a new album. This one will be recorded at the famous Abbey Road Studios, mm. and they are currently finishing up a tour. So <laughs> Dead Can Dance, still touring Australia and most of New Zealand. <laughs> I shouldn't take shots at them. They sold half a million records in the United States. That's pretty damn impressive. Yeah, it's true. Even if it was 1992. <laughs> I'm assuming they're still probably big, big in Australia and some parts of New Zealand. <laughs> um, not so much in London anymore. And that leads us to our last song, Miami Beach Roomba by the Cle Klezmer Conservatory Band. And guys, this one's going to be quick. The Klezmer Conservatory Band was a Boston-based group which performed traditional Klezmer music. You know, Klezmer uh. music. <laughs> so I looked it up. Um, the long and short is Yiddish. They performed Yiddish music. Mm, okay. Formed by Hankus Netsky. He was of the New England Conservatory of Music in 1980. They actually were originally formed for one single concert, but stayed and staying together and have gone on to release 11 albums. They were even the featured band in 1988 documentary on klezmer called a jumping night in the garden of eden Pretty good for like a, a put together band like string orchestra 
type deal. They were only supposed to play one show. They ended up playing 11 albums in 20 plus years. Music. Pushing <laughs> music. Well, I can't wait to get to our final thoughts, but there was two bands that were in this that I had no idea existed. And of course, one of them was going to be huge in Australia. Of course. I mean, there was no way. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when you see a band you don't recognize, they're huge in Australia. Huge in Australia. Huge. <laughs> all kinds. Make it all kinds of didgeridoos. <laughs> Let's go give our final thoughts on this episode. All right. I feel like their hundreds would be called like Herman's. <laughs> Koalas. I am kicking off this week with my final thoughts. Because I said I was going to defend that weird kind of ending where they just walk away. I saw this ending coming. As in, I saw there was to be no justice for the Patriotic Brigade. They're a bunch of waffles. And I know Baker and Dwayne get shot. But in general, the Patriotic Brigade just continues to exist. And the Vice team has nothing that they can do about it. Now, you would think that the white supremacist groups that were in Miami would be white and vices. We all house they do. Hookers, prostitution, gambling, drugs, like white supremacy, you would think would be right in those crosshairs. Which it makes sense why Sunny knows who these people are. And you can see the frustration with them that there's nothing that they can do. That the vice team can't move on the patriotic brigade. They can't do anything about it. At the end, when Helen Jackson gets killed, and they now know where Kozak is, and Baker and Dwayne are dead. Like, what else is there for them to do? The, the, the only people that they can move on, or sorry, the only people that are left in this is the patriotic brigade and they can't do anything about them so you can see their frustration being to the max on this that they're really up a creek and that that's how this would make sense being the second to last episode ever of miami vice is that seeing them how frustrated they are that nothing ever works out they can't bring anyone to justice including this brigade that is gonna do more crimes they know it but at least I guess they got the Fuentes and the Diablos. I guess that's the thing <laughs> that worked out for them. Yeah. But that's what I'm saying. It's, you know, it's and just the lead to them, their frustration, and they just walk away. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I see what you're saying. Technically, they didn't successfully do any, accomplish any actual part of their job. I mean, in full. The Fuentes and the Diablos kind of took care of each other. They didn't actually arrest anyone or or successfully initiate that sting. Angelo pops up and shoots their suspect before they can book her. Ever actually arrest the person who was killing everybody. And she killed the white supremacist leader. So they don't actually get to bring him to justice. So like at the end of the day, their whole undercover sting, uh, ultimately, it indir indirectly, I guess, they kind of helped close all of these storylines. But pretty much they were just along for the ride. Like they didn't actually accomplish anything themselves. Like uh, Miss Jackson and the Diablos and the Fuentes, like they they took care of each other. And that's what I'm saying. It's like their <laughs> frustration. They couldn't do anything. Yeah, they were just yeah. bystanders in all of this. You know, and I think you are 100% right about that. For, for me, I'm a, a slightly different point in that I really like this episode because I think this is this episode is so on point with what's going on today kind of politically and i know we try not to get into politics too much you know we made some we made jokes and made fun of some stuff today but it is very on point with what's kind of going on today and you almost feel like this episode could be an episode of law and order today everything in this episode i think was pretty on point message wise and storyline wise all, all the way i just like the look of the end when they walked away like that it just kind of cheese cheese balled it at the very end so but that aside i thought it was a fantastic episode one that i thought you could literally run it today and and it would work that plot and that that storyline could be uh, on anything and it would be like ripped from the headlines. I think that that's pretty impressive considering that, you know, it's a it's an episode from over 20, 20 years ago. And I think they did a, a good job of making that point period to of making strong points periodically through the episode while it's still being a, a regular vice episode and still having that vice episode feel with I, I do feel like it's been a while since we've had a boat or a car chase. So I guess kind of hoping that that we get a few of those coming up in the next uh, few of the lost episodes. But all in all, good episode. Really good episode. Melissa, what are your final thoughts? I always really like this episode. I think 
part of it, the reason why I like this episode too, is because it feels like it kind of goes back in time to the previous seasons. Also, you see like that Crockett's wearing like his old, his old style of clothing. He's wearing the pink shirt and the white jacket and they're, and they're kind of still making fun and making jokes, but there's always, it's obviously a very serious episode. And once again, Vice does it where they go head on against a serious thing that was ripped from the headlines at that time. During that time, that was, that was something that was going on. They were, they were still hunting down people for the war crimes and they were still bringing them to justice. It doesn't, you don't see it as much today, but because those people are, have been, have passed away. So it, it was a big story of the time. And I think you guys are right. You hit on that. It, it's kind of strange that you could you could play it today and it would still ring true. There are still people <laughs> that believe those things in that episode, and they did a very good job of making those people look <laughs> crazy. Yeah, like it was yeah. crazy. Um, I I don't know about the ending. I never really thought about the ending how they walk away. I think they were trying to make a point, obviously, because they say like, yeah, he that they're dead, but I wish that they could take their message with them too. You know, like there's no way to get rid of them. It's basically like no matter how many people you kill or you get rid of or, or they arrest or whatever, the message will still be out there and it'll just be carried on by somebody else. It's just going to be a new person to pick up the torch. And, and so they, they leave because I feel like they're trying to say like, there's nothing else we can do. So we're just going to walk away. And that's, I mean, it's a little goofy, but <laughs> <laughs> But other than that, I think it's a great episode. I think it, I mean, great acting and great guest stars with real acting careers behind them. And yep. you can tell there's, you know. Mm-hmm. And that's going to do it for us this week on Go With The Heat. We hope you enjoyed this episode. We would love to hear from you. Email us, goewiththeheat at gmail.com. Let us know what you think about this episode. You can also find us on Facebook at Go With The Heat, Twitter at Go With The Heat, Instagram at Go With The Heat. You know how to get a hold of us. You can find us at Go With The Heat pretty much anywhere and everywhere. Be sure to check out that website, GoWithTheHeat.com. And you can find all those ways to contact us, all the ways to subscribe, all the ways to support the show. Support step number one, contact us. Email us, GoWithTheHeat at gmail.com. Support step number two, check out that Patreon. You want to get those stickers? You got to get them in soon because if you're a patron in the month of January and you're Payment goes through on February 1st. I'm going to get that list together and I'm going to send out stickers to everyone. you got, got to make sure that you are on that list because this will be the only time we are going to have merch for this show. We only have five episodes to go. This is your one shot to get in on a merch for this show. Support step number three. Go to your podcast, your platform of choice, and leave us a review. At this stage, we would love more people to be able to find the show and be able to find it after we're done. But also, this is a great opportunity to go in there and, you know, a swan song. Tell us how much you love us. <laughs> go in there and leave a review inside of your podcatcher platform. A choice. Uh, we, we would love to see that now that we only have five episodes to go. We've made 100. This is our 127th episode. So we'd love to see those things. We'd love to see what you think about the show. That's and if great. you don't want to tell us how much, how great you think we are, then tell us. Do you think Angelo knows where Tubbs Jr. is? <laughs> <laughs> That's going to do it for us this week. We hope you enjoyed this episode, and we'll see you all next time. Bye, pals.